Thanks. Uh, with this, I would like to say thanks to our worthy vice chancellor, uh, the Cholistan University of Veterinary Animal Sciences, Bahawalpur, for being an excellent supervisor and the administrator for, for this scientific gathering. Uh, and with this, uh, special thanks to the uh, Department of Parasitology and the members, uh, Professor uh, Mazur Yaz, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Sabika, and myself, Dr. Jamal Muhammad Khan. The title uh, of today's uh, conference, the scientific gathering, uh, is uh, the vaccine against the arthropod borne disease. But before uh, we jump uh, toward and step ahead toward the topic and the talks, I uh, would request our worthy vice chancellor uh, for sharing a few words of thanks to our respected guests and listeners and speakers. Uh, and with this, uh, I request our uh, vice chancellor, uh, please proceed for, for the welcoming note. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, thank you, Jamal. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Mazhar. Uh, it's uh, my, indeed uh, a very pleasant duty to welcome Dr. Monica and Dr. Imran uh, for today's talk. Uh, it's always uh, heartening to see that uh, uh, people are discussing things and uh, they are trying to come up uh, with some conclusions uh, that can be implemented or at least the awareness of uh, the veterinarians and animal scientists uh, that improves uh, with these uh, e-conferences and e-talks. So thanking everybody, uh, uh, thanking Dr. Mazar and his team uh, for arranging this and uh, uh, special thanks to Dr. Monica and Dr. Imran for sparing time uh, because we have, this is I think our 22nd lecture of the series and uh, I am sure that a few more are planned this week and then we have uh, uh, on 15th we have uh, I think uh, a gentleman from Kenya Dr. Jacob Wanyama, and uh, he'll be with us uh, for shedding light why this indigenous knowledge is important. So uh, I'm waiting for his talk also, but uh, right now uh, I thank everybody for joining and I thank my team uh, led by Dr. Mazar, and I'm sure we'll be enjoying uh, Dr. Jamal's moderation also today. Uh, so with that, uh, all my uh, good wishes and success for today's talks. Uh, I hope I hope that I'll be trying to come back. I'll be busy busy in other things, but uh, I'll try to uh, join either towards the end if possible. So thank you very much, Jamal. It's over to you. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, really, your words means a lot to me. It was uh, a strength for me. And taking the liberty and the respect and love from your side, I would take a few frank words to uh, tell something about our university that we have a beautiful, magnificent scientific arena in the middle of the desert, which is Cholistan University. And not just this, uh, I would say again from on the behalf of our uh, respected caring uh, worthy vice chancellor that all the respected international uh, speakers listeners they are more than welcome to come to this season of, of mango the sweet mangoes and, and and this is all on the behalf of our vice chancellor i'm saying uh, since we are living, well, we are having the mango season so from mangoes to the science uh, i would uh, i would i would say uh, some words about the the topic uh, which uh, is vaccine against the arthro-borne disease. To be specific and highlight the importance of, of, of this topic, uh, this topic has been chosen. It has a huge economic impact uh, on the farmers uh, herd and, and, and this 
arthropod uh, carrying uh, the single uh, protozoan blood parasite, uh, which uh, harms the animal health and production, uh, which is uh, a direct loss to the farmer and its, its, its income. So keeping in view the importance, the economic importance and the animal's health and the farmer's herd losses, uh, we have chosen this topic to how to control, how to adopt the, uh, the, the measures, the strategies uh, to, to have a check on the uh, losses for the farmers. Uh, the way forward, uh, which comes to a scientific mind is uh, the long lasting, a permanent check uh, spot is uh, the development of vaccine. Uh, this parasite, which I would mention, say Babesia, I uh, would call it as a disease, Babesiosis, uh, the blood parasite, uh, it affects the health, the immunity of the animal, uh, and drops the production. Uh, so the development of vaccine against it seems to be the need of our. So we are in dire need uh, to develop a vaccine uh, and uh, experts with us, uh, they will be sharing their thoughts and knowledge on this. Uh, so I will now, uh, could not let you uh, scientists and respected friends wait more. Uh, I would like to introduce our respected uh, guest and, and, and speaker, uh, which is Miss uh, Monica. Uh, from Argentina. And Monica, before I start, before I invite you, I would say you congratulations on the eve of your national day. Uh, congratulations. So you will, uh, I hope you will be enjoying much more days like this. And in addition to this, I pray that on the Sundays, Argentina will beat Brazil in the Copa America final. Uh, this is something I, I have been waiting for quite a long time. Uh, to give into the insight, World of vaccinology, babesiosis. We have uh, distinguished, uh, esteemed professor, uh, Dr. Monica. Uh, please welcome. Uh, step ahead and share your knowledge, your school of thought. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please to you, Miss Money, Dr. Monica. Dr. Monica, do you hear me? Some there seems some internet uh, disability, internet problem with Ms. Dr. Monica, and we are trying to figure out if she. Uh, she joins us as soon as possible. Our technical team I, is on. The I am back. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It, my connection went unstable, but I think okay. I, everything will be fine now. Dr. Monica, I, Dr. Monica, yes. I, I, I have a, a small request. Uh, when you lost us on the internet, what was the last uh, words you, you heard from my side? Nothing. I, I, the counselor was was speaking, so I okay. I, I I missed I, I missed your part. Sorry about that. Uh, well, I understand this technical problem. I was saying that our vice chancellor was very kind and he was welcoming uh, welcoming you and the uh, other speaker. He was more than happy and he wishes uh, you to come and see our jewel here in the middle of the desert, which is our university. And he says, uh, congratulations on the Argentinian National oh, yeah. Day. And he also says that on Sunday, Argentina <laughs> yeah. will beat Brazil in the Copa America final. And, and Argentina will be lifting the trophy, which I'm waiting for to see for quite a long time. And a uh, lot of no speakers, they just cannot wait more. Please uh, step ahead and share your knowledge with us on, on this important topic. Thank you very much. Please, to you. Thank you. All right. I, I want to thank uh, this invitation, especially Dr. Ayas, that was very kind to invite me to give this talk and to speak a little bit about uh, bovine babesiosis and also some of our research that we have been doing. 
uh, for the last few years. And uh, I think it can be also an opportunity for building some kind of collaboration. If you see grounds for doing this in this or other areas of research that we are carrying out, we will be very happy. I will share my screen now. And uh, please let me know if you see it well. Oh, yes, I can. See, I yes, Miss Monica, we, 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 yeah, we can definitely see your presentation very much clear. Please proceed on and, right. and, and everybody is watching and listening to you. All ears to you, all, right. all ears to you. Thank you very much. So I'm okay, you already heard my name. I, I, I'm a senior researcher from the National Research Council of Argentina. And I work in an institute that is um, the Institute of Veterinary Pathobiology that belongs to INTA in uh, close to Buenos Aires. It's, it's in the Buenos Aires province of Argentina. So to speak about bovine babesiosis, I want to give a little bit a historical background. And to understand the, the disease, one needs to go back to uh, North America uh, by the end of the 19th century. What happened there is that there were frequent, frequent movements of cattle from the southern to the northern states looking for better markets to sell these animals. And uh, what happened in that uh, trip is that the southern cattle, which was apparently healthy, was transmitting something to the northern cattle that made them very sick. They increased their temperature and they also had hemoglobinuria. And for this reason, this uh, unknown disease was called Texas fever or red water. And they didn't know what, what was going on. They just knew that when the southern cattle came to the north, they would bring this disease. And the problem was so big because the northern cattle would die that in many states, the southern cattle was forbidden. So they did not allow the, no, the southern cattle to enter. Uh, this prompted a lot of research and it was two, uh, North, two US or North American scientists that in 1893, they was, these were Smith and Kilburn, they discovered that this red water was a tick transmitted protozoan, so that it was transmitted by ticks. Before that, they thought that there was something in the legs, something in the saliva, but these were the two first people that associated the disease with a tick transmitted agent. And so this became the first uh, vector borne a disease that was ever uh, described. Actually, uh, five years before uh, this discovery uh, in Romania, there was an Austrian scientist, Victor Babes, that he associated the presence of an intraerythrocytic microorganism that he thought was a bacterium, and he called it Hematococcus bovis and he associated it with hemoglobinuria in bovines. He became very well known, very famous because of his discovery. So here you see the stamps that were uh, prepared in his honor. And uh, for this reason, his name was Babes. So this parasite uh, was uh, termed Babesia and the disease bovine babesiosis. The parasite that Babes described turned out to be Babesia bovis, later named Babesia bovis. And the parasite that Smith and Kilburn had described in the US or in, the, in North America at that time was Babesia bigemina. Um, after that, many, many species were discovered of Babesia. Right now, there are about 100 Babesia species that have been identified, and they infect different types of mammals, uh, domestic, wild animals, and also humans and also they were to infect birds. But in the case of bovines, which is we will, what we will deal here today, there are three Babesia species that are the most important. Babesia bovis, Babesia bigemina, and also Babesia divergence. Although the numbers of animals that Babesia divergence affect are much less. In the case of Babesia bovis and bigemina, they are transmitted by ripicephalus ticks. 
and several species of Ripicephalus had been described, the most important is Microplus. But also Ripicephalus australis, actually, uh, this is uh, the, the, the tick, pres the, the cattle tick present in Australia. It was thought to be Ripicephalus microplus, but afterwards it was identified as a new species. And also others like Anulatus gaigi. And in the case of Bigemina, there are two additional tick species that also transmit Babesia bigemina, which means that Babesia bigemina is a bit more distributed than Bovis. They are both in tropical and subtropical areas of the world. And in, in those areas, there are 500 or more than 500 million cattle heads at risk. In the case of Babesia divergence, it's another type of tick, Ixodes ricinus, the ones who, that transmit it. And it is distributed in another area. It, it goes from Europe, to, from Northern Europe to the North of Africa. And the most important thing about Babesia divergence is that it can be zoonotic. It can be transmitted to humans. I am, a, while doing this presentation, I'm also going to show some of the, the publications that we have produced where this information can be found. And so all this information about Babesias you can find, find in this one. And whoever is interested in these papers and cannot get, I'm very happy to send them to, to those people. Um, this is the short life cycle of bovine Babesia species and of many other Babesia, real Babesia. These are called true Babesia or Babesia sensu stricto that uh, they only have in the mammal, they only have the erythrocyte as host cell. The cycle begins when a stage called sporozoite invades the red cells and the, um, the parasite reproduces uh, by binary fission. It produces tumorozoites that afterwards leave the erythrocyte, invade another erythrocyte and so on uh, in a, a sexual uh, cycle. Eventually, the morozoites produce something called gamons, which are um, destined to be gametes. And then the cycle continues when a tick um, sucks the blood of a bovine, and then these gametes become, uh, these gamonts become gametes. These are like ray bodies that fuse and produce a zygote. And afterwards, this will also reproduce asexually. After this sexual reproduction, the other one is asexual and invades different tick tissues. It is motile and can invade different tick tissues, including the ovaries of the female tick. And so in the ovaries, it goes to the eggs, which means that the next generation, the larvae of the next generation will be infected. That is called transovarial transmission. And it also, this is, this um, kinets, they also invade the salivary glands of the tick. Before and in the salivary gland, Yes. Sorry. I didn't understand. Oh, okay. Uh, shall I go on? The in the tick. It, continue, please. Yeah? Continue. Okay, okay. In this, in the tick, it invades. It's the salivary. And then when the tick uh, has another blood meal, it transmits, it transmits this stage, which is the infective stage called sporozoite. And okay, then the cycle continues. Uh, I'm going to show now a timeline of the development of vaccines against bovine babesiosis, all the, all the most important milestones of this development. As I mentioned before, at the end of the 19th century, there was the first observation of the agent of the Babesia in Romania. Then it was found that it was a tick transmitted protozoan five years later. And there was quite some knowledge at the end of the 19th century about this disease. People knew that the main clinical signs were fever, and hematocrit decrease, they knew that there was an inverse 
relationship between the age and morbidity or mortality, which means that the young cattle, the calves, were more resistant. They were less susceptible to the disease, while the adults were very susceptible. They also knew that a inoculation of infected blood produces a milder disease than the bites of the infected ticks through observations, right? And they knew that when cattle, they started making experiments and they saw that when cattle were inoculated with infected blood, they developed protective immunity. So the blood vaccine started and actually blood vaccines is what we still have after so many years. There, there has not been so much change. The most important change happened in the middle, mid of the 70s, when uh, some researchers found, found how to attenuate the strains because the first blood vaccines were just uh, virulent parasites. That, and so I'm sure that there were many, many dead cattle after vaccination. They were regu regulating the dose so that the animal would be vaccinated but not die. But in the 70s, they discovered how to attenuate these strains, which means what the procedure was to inoculate animals, normally splectomized without spleen, it was high, they would take the blood of this infected and inoculate another cow and then another one and so on until 30, 37 passages. And the resulting strain that came out of the 30th or 35th uh, cow, uh, th these parasites were mild. They were not virulent. They would infect, they were alive, but they would not produce disease. So they were called attenuated. And these are the strains that are used nowadays, attenuated strains. Now, it is not known what happened there. What happened during this 35 passages that uh, made from a violent strain that was isolated from the field to an attenuated strain. Maybe they lost the expression of a gene that determines virulence, or perhaps as a population was selected that was already present in the initial inoculum, and then uh, they, the, the, the mildest or there are epigenetic mechanisms involved. Actually, this is a matter of research. We still don't know what is going on in those 35 passages that end up with an attenuated strain, but they have been extremely useful for vaccination purposes. Then the next milestone was the development of in vitro culture, it, because otherwise the only way to produce these vaccines is inoculating cows and then taking the blood from these animals, aliquoting it in flasks, and those are the vaccines. But in vitro culture was developed and using bovine erythrocytes, the, the host cell that the, the babesias will invade, bovine serum or otherwise lipid enriched serum albumin, a buffer and preferably low tension of oxygen. They prefer a micro aerophilic atmosphere. The um, cultures have been very useful in Babesia research to maintain strains, to characterize antigens for drug assays, to do zero neutralization assays that I will speak more about those, to produce transgenic variants using uh, techniques, uh, special techniques, um, to do morphological studies and also for vaccine production. Then the following uh, milestone was the um, tools to develop the tools to freeze these strains, to be able to keep them in liquid nitrogen. And uh, then the frozen vaccines were possible both for Babesia bovis and Babesia bigemina. And two cryopreservants were tried, glycerol and the MSO. Afterwards, it was seen that glycerol is milder, so it does not um, kill so many of the Babesias. So these are, this is the whole thing 
of the um, of the vaccines that we are using today, the currently used vaccines. They are either produced in vitro, in cultures, as I mentioned, or in vivo, in cows. And they are either refrigerated to keep the babesias alive for a little bit longer, or they are frozen. And so we will see now which is the situation around the world of a vaccine production. And in not all the countries that I will show, they are actively producing the vaccine, but maybe they have produced vaccines or they are able to do it, but not necessarily they are doing it right now. In flags, in blue flags, you will see which countries have or are producing um, frozen vaccines that they are commercialized in liquid, in little thermos of liquid nitrogen. And okay, one of the countries is Argentina. In Argentina, we are producing both frozen and also refrigerated vaccine and a few other countries around the world. Then, as I mentioned, there are two types of vaccines. One are in vitro culture, they are represented with this flask in red and others are in vivo produced by inoculating a splenectomized cow with parasites and then reaching the peak of parasitemia, taking the blood and that is the aliquoting the vaccine. So most countries that are producing vaccines are doing it in vivo, in animals. This is the situation in Argentina. As I mentioned, we produce both the refrigerated and the frozen one. And there are three institutes that um, if anybody's interested, I can tell you more about that in another occasion, that are producing these types of vaccines. Two of these institutes are state-owned. They belong to the same uh, institution that where I work, INTA. And the other one is a private, uh, a private enter enterprise that is using a royalty from INTA to develop this vaccine. Normally around the world, in most places, it is always a state, um, a state business because it is um, not, not, many, not very convenient from, uh, from, from many different points of view, as I will mention. All right. I mentioned before that there is an inverse age response a relationship with respect to morbidity and mortality. What does it mean? If you have an adult animal and also a calf, a young animal, in the adult, there will be morbidity, this clinical signs that I was talking about, and also mortality. While, and when? When these animals are exposed for the first time to an infected tick, to a tick infected with Babesia, bovis or by gemina. But if a, a calf is bitten by a, by a tick, by an infected tick, it will most likely not develop any clinical signs. It will remain healthy. That is because it has innate immune response mechanisms that don't allow clinical signs to develop. But that calf will develop a persistent infection, that means that the babesias will stay in uh, their, their blood in low parasitemia levels, but will stay, and it will also be immune per life. That means that those calves that receive this first inocula natural inoculation of a tick will be protected. It's a natural vaccination, while adults if they receive the tick for the first time, they will become sick. So the vaccination is not really necessary in the case of enzootic equilibrium, which is enzootic equilibrium means, means that there is a constant, a high infection rate by the bite of infected ticks. Permanently, there are ticks that are infected. When the calves are born, immediately they get they, they are infected by ticks and the ticks transmit to them the babesias and then they remain um, immune protected per life. But the vaccination is necessary when there is enzootic disequilibrium. That means that the calves can reach adulthood without being exposed to the babesia parasites. 
And for example, if an acaricide is used in a field, but the following year it is discontinued, that means that in that in when when the acaricide is used, the cows they don't receive the tick bite with the Babesia parasites. But some ticks stay there, some ticks are still around, and then the following year the acaricide is not applied or the ticks have developed resistance, which is something that happens. And then the adult animals, uh, sorry, the calves will not, um, the, the, the animals that did not receive the tick bite when they were young, they will be, they will receive the tick bite when they are adult and when they are susceptible. In those cases of enzootic disequilibrium, the vaccine is recommended. And also, when there is movement of cattle from tick free to tick endemic regions. That happens, for example, in Argentina, that the, in the Pampas that are tick free, the animals are born, but then they are taken to northern fields where they are fed. And, um, and those north, in those northern, northern parts of the country, they are tick endemic. And then before moving this cattle to this tick, endemic regions, the animals need to be vaccinated. These live vaccines that are available are generally effective, but they have a costly production. There is a risk of contamination with other microorganisms because of the way they are, they are produced. There is a risk of reversion to the virulent phenotype because you have to remember that they are attenuated strains with still unknown mechanisms. They started from a virulent type and there have been reports of this type of reversion. They are not attractive for biotechnology based companies because of the nuisance of working with live parasites the parasites are alive and protection depends on being alive. So they have a short half-life when they are refrigerated. And if they are commercialized frozen, there are high costs of storage and delivery because permanently they need to be frozen. And also the moment that they are thawed, they have very little, a very little half-life. The efficacy of the vaccine depends on a strict cold chain. And importantly, they are only safe in animals that are younger than one year of age. Um, although these are attenuated strains, for reasons that are still not known, the adult animals, they can get disease. So they, they receive the attenuated vaccine. If they are older than one year, they can develop clinical signs and even die. And this is very important when, especially when this, um, when animals that are very expensive, like uh, bulls that are used for reproduction are vaccinated and they need to be monitored very, uh, very well so that they don't die from one moment to the other. The acute babesiosis can have uh, an outcome, a, a fatal outcome very fast. So most of these inconveniences could be overcome by a subunit vaccine. As you probably know, a subunit vaccine is one that only contains an antigenic part of the pathogen, not the whole pathogen. And this part can be isolated from the pathogen or produced by recombinant DNA technology. To, to be able to develop such a subunit vaccine, one can have different approaches. And these three approaches are being used by different scientists around the world, uh, including our group. Uh, one is to make a rational search for Babesia merosoite antigens that participate in erythrocyte invasion. That is the one approach that I will speak about. One can also search for Babesia sexual state antigens and the, the aim of this search is to develop transmission blocking vaccines. That means vaccines that will not allow the parasite to be transmitted by ticks. 
And another approach in which we have a project ongoing, it's an international project that we are participating, is to identify antigens in culture supernatants that are recognized by sera of infected animals, and then check if one of these uh, antigens can be protective. To understand the approach of finding um, antigens in the merozoite, one needs to remember that Babesia are protozoa of the apicomplexa phylum, and all the protozoa in this phylum, they are obligate intracellular parasites. So for these parasites, the process of invasion and ingress from the host are basic and essential for survival. So they are very efficient. They need, they need to in invade a cell to be able to survive. If they are left outside of the cell, they cannot survive and they die. For this reason, the molecules that are involved in erythrocyte invasion are very attractive vaccine targets. The process of invasion of an erythrocyte has several steps. There is first a recognition. The parasite membrane somehow recognizes the erythrocyte membrane so that the parasite knows that needs to do something there in that, in that penetrate that membrane. Then the parasite reorients itself facing with the apical complex, the, the surface of the erythrocyte. Then the parasite releases the contents of its apical complex. There are uh, secretory organelles like rock trees and, and dense granules that are, and the contents is released into the erythrocyte. Then the parasite penetrates the erythrocyte forming a parasitophorous vacuole, as it's shown here. And finally, in the case of Babesia, this vacuole is destroyed and the parasite remains in direct contact with the erythrocyte cytoplasm. This process, as I said, is very efficient and these pictures were taken by a Japanese a researcher, Asada, some time ago. Uh, this, the Babesias, here you see the, the red cell and the Babesias, they are green because they have been transfected with, uh, the, for the gene for a green fluorescent protein. So they, they, they express this green fluorescent protein and then one can see them in, in, by, by video microscopy. And if you consider this time zero of one particular uh, infected red cell, 10 seconds already there has been a movement of the merozoite towards the membrane. 80 sec at 80 seconds, you see that the parasites are already out of that erythrocyte. At 90 seconds, they are searching for other erythrocytes. You see here, this one found already one. And then at 170 seconds, which means a little bit less than three minutes later, one has already needed and the other one is about to invade another erythrocyte. So it, it shows that this process is highly efficient. And then if one can affect this process in one stage or the other, in one way or the other, a vaccine could be possible. It is not known, it is a matter of research, which are the correlates of protection. It is something, for that reason, I put hypothesis, because this is what is thought. Which, what, are, what is needed in a vaccine candidate to elicit a protective immune response? Well, of course, they have to, to elicit an immune response, but this immune response needs to be humoral and cellular which means that these things, they need to contain B cell epitopes and also T cell epitopes. This is what is thought, right? What is hypothesized? And based on this hypothesis is that one is doing the research. There needs to be protection of IgG2 and also of, of interferon gamma. The, the antigen, the vaccine candidate needs to be located on the surface so that when antibodies are produced, uh, the antibodies can, uh, can attack this antigen. They need to be conserved, this is obvious, among parasite geographic isolates. 
because one wants the vaccine to act on, on different um, countries, not only on the local ones. And so the antigen should not be too variable. And they need to have neutralization sensitive B cell epitopes. It means that antibodies directed against those epitopes will block invasion. And this is an uh, indication that the chosen antigen is essential for survival, because if an antibody against it blocks the invasion of the erythrocyte, that means that that antigen was needed for that invasion, and invasion is essential for survival. Well, we have studied for quite a while um, antigens that are bound to the surface membrane by glycolipid anchors. These glycolipid anchors are called GPI. And why? Because these GPI anchored proteins are particularly abundant in pathogenic protozoa. They have been very much studied in Toxoplasma gondii, in Trypanosoma cruzae, in a Plasmodium, and okay, also in Babesias. They are surface exposed. They participate in the initial recognition of the host cell this first step in which the membranes bound, it, it has been shown that somehow they help in the recognition between the parasite and the host cell membrane. In general, they are very antigenic and immunodominant. Immunodominant means that the sera from most infected animals will have antibodies against these antigens. And importantly, in two parasites, in two Babesia parasites, Babesia divergence, a bovine Babesia, and Babesia canis, which is a dog Babesia, there have been effective vaccines based on recombinant GPI anchored proteins. So in, on one GPI anchored protein. So we um, hypothesize that a GPI anchored protein of Babesia bovis, which is of the uh, Babesia is the one that we mostly uh, study, could be protective, a protective vaccine antigen for bovine babesiosis. Um, this is a scheme of a GPI anchored protein. What you see down here is the plasma membrane and among the phospholipids there will be a phosphatidyl inositol that is part of the GPI molecule. PI, phosphatidyl inositol. Then comes glucosamine, then mannose residues, ethanolamine, and then the protein. This thing here is the protein. So the proteins are linked through this glycolipid, because the glyco, the sugar part, and then the lipid part, through the glycolipid to the plasma membrane. we started studying how important are the GPIs for Babesia bovis? How important is the synthesis of GPI? So we incubated Babesia bovis cultures with manosamine. Manosamine acts, here you see it in the left, this is a, a representation of the GPI molecule, and it acts inhibiting the binding of one mannose residue to the other, the first to the second, and then the GPI cannot be formed. So by incubating with manosamine, we were analyzing how important is the synthesis of GPI for this parasite. And what you see in the graph are the results in T0, where this is cultures incubated with different concentrations of manosamine, 0 0.1 millimolar, 0 0.3, 1, 3, 10, and incubated for 72 hours. At zero, which means that no manosamine, the, there was an infected percent, uh, a percentage, sorry, of infected erythrocytes of about 12%. And the lowest concentrations did not have any effect. But when the concentrations started increasing, there was a dose dependent inhibition of growth. Finally, in the in 10 millimolar, which is similar to has been concentration that has been used for the same kind of experiments in Plasmodium falciparum, the parasites could not grow. So manosamine has a strong inhibitory effect on the with in vitro growth. We also did another kind of approach 
which was to incubate the Babesia bovis morosoides with phos a phospholipase C specific for phosphatidyl inositol. The um, phospholipase is an enzyme that cleaves the phospholipids. And in this case, it cleaves the GPI, both free and GPI anchored. Free, I have not introduced that idea before, but a free means that they are not bound to proteins. And we have seen that Babesia bovis has a lot of free GPIs as well, but also has a, a great number of GPI anchored proteins. And those are separated from the cell by this treatment. So we hypothesized that when the, the parasite had its GPIs intact, it would be able to invade an erythrocyte, as usually happens. But when it was treated with a phospholipase C specific for phosphatidyl inositol, then the cleavage, the GPIs were, would be no longer there and invasion would not be possible. So we did the experiment and that is exactly what we obtained. What you see here are smears where Babesia bovis um, was incubated with a, a parasite, sorry, were incubated with erythrocytes for four hours. And there you see some that have already been able to invade. While in the lower smear, you see parasites that were previously incubated with the phospholipase and then with the erythrocytes, and most were outside. And when one counted them in the numbers, it shows the same. In this case, you have to the, to the left, incubated with phospholipase C. You see that at zero, four, 18 hours later, very, very little invasion happened. While in the control, it was significant. One could really measure the parasites inside the cells. So the phospholipase C treatment uh, of Babesia bovis merosoides abolishes invasion. And these results are pointing at the importance of this glycolipid and the glycolipid anchored proteins for the survival of the parasite. And okay, these are the uh, manuscripts that resulted from this work. And by showing this, I also want to acknowledge the other authors that participated in the work in some cases. In most cases, they were also PhD students doing their work. So uh, speaking about the GPI anchored proteins, uh, which are which GPI anchored proteins are there in Babesia bovis? This work, this initial work, is I carried out in the U.S. in a postdoctoral stay in Washington State University with Guy Palmer, Terry McElwain, Steve Hines, and Carlos Suarez. And from them, I learned what, most of what I know about Babesia, and also I learned a lot of molecular biology techniques in that stay. That was more or less 20, 20 years ago. Um, the, the, the main antigens that are GPI anchored in Babesia bovis are members of a variable merosoid surface antigen family that is composed of five proteins, MSA1, 2A1, 2A2, 2B, and 2C. And they have Mm, a different variable degree of polymorphism. That means changes of amino acids when one analyzes different geographic isolates of the parasite. All of them are expressed on the surface of merosa. They contain epitopes, that means that antibodies directed against these proteins um, inhibit invasion, block invasion. And here you see in these slides, um, live immunofluorescence, which means that the parasites, intact parasites are incubated with the antibodies, not on a slide, but on a tube. And then only the antibodies can react with the surface of the parasite. So you see here with antibodies against MSA2C, the parasites are uh, labeled, which means that the antigen is on their surface. This is a slide by Dr. Echaide from Argentina. And here it's a fixed immunofluorescence where another antibodies, another antigen, MSA1, were uh, incubated with the parasites. But in this case, 
the parasites were fixed on a smear, so with acetone, the antibodies can enter the parasite and one can stain, for example, the nuclei with a blue DAPI or a, also an organelle, the ROP3, which is from the apical complex, a protein of the ROP3, ROP1, was stained in red. And this smear is from Juan Mosqueda, Dr. Juan Mosqueda from Mexico. And here you see also the labeling with anti-MSA1 antibodies in green. And you, one can see that it's very homogeneous. It's distributed on the whole surface of the parasite. And these are two papers that came out of that uh, first, my initial steps in the Babesia world in Pullman. Uh, when I returned to Argentina, we continued working on these GPI anchored proteins, and especially in one that I, we, we discovered during that, those studies, which is MSA2C. MSA2C of the VMSA is the most conserved is highly conserved among geographic isolates. And that is something that you see here in this alignment. Here are the, um, the different the amino acid sequences of the different uh, isolates from South and North America. And what you see in black with white letters are regions of complete conservation. Well, if you see it in white with dark letters, those are different um, differences, polymorphism. So, but you see that it's quite very much conserved about over 80, 85% more or less among different isolates. We have observed that it's highly antigenic, but there's a fast and persistent response. The H1 means important for protection and battle and in mice. And that it induces interferon gamma in mice. The experiment was only done in mice, but that is something that one needed also for a vaccine candidate. So we could conclude that MSA2C is an attractive vaccine candidate for Babesia bovis. And these are the resulting uh, manuscripts of this work. We also wanted to see what happens when one takes an antigen that is not so conserved, but it's moderately polymorphic. But can, can one still find uh, protective epitopes in this, uh, in this moderately polymorphic antigen? So we took MSA2B. And here you see an alignment of the amino acid sequences of MSA2B. And as you can see, there is more, much more white, right, than in the case of MSA2C, which means that there are more areas that are polymorphic than in the other case. But still, one could find conserved regions that, uh, that, could, that had B cell epitope which means the region of the protein that is recognized by an antibody. For example, this YYKKHI is. Those are the amino acids forming this B cell epitope. So to do this, what, what we did was to sequence the alleles of MSA2B from strains of Argentina and Mexico as two distant geographic regions we did an alignment and predicted in silico, that means with bioinformatic programs, B cell epitopes. Then we saw which ones were conserved that were present in all of the strains. And then with those sequences, peptides were chemically synthesized. So let's speak about this YYKKIHIS peptide. We obtained it in in two different formats, conjugated to KLH and free. Free means just a peptide. And conjugated is that one binds it to something that is a little bit bigger than this keyhole limpet hemocyanine eh, to induce an immune response in the mice. Because if one injects the mice only with a peptide, no antibodies will, will appear. So there we got a hyperimmune serum. And this serum 
was antibodies against this peptide. And we tested it in immunofluorescence against the parasite. And as you see, <coughs> the parasite was labeled, which means that the antibodies recognize the parasite. But more importantly, these antibodies against this peptide neutralized invasion, which means that Uh, they, the antibodies block invasion of the intracellular. You see, when the pests were incubated, another antibodies against another peptide that was not blocking invasion. And when they were incubated with antibodies against this particular peptide, and you see that there was no, uh, there was very uh, significantly less uh, infected erythrocytes in the experiment. Um, so the an conclusion, the anti-peptide antibodies reacted with hemorrhoids and neutralized invasion. And we used the free antibodies that were not bound to anything to make an indirect ELISA. And then we tested in this ELISA sera from bovines that were infected with Babesia bovis or not. And you see in the, the bars, the high bars show recognition of the peptide, while the low bars show no recognition. And the sera of the bovines that were infected with Babesia bovis recognized the peptide, while the, the, the others that didn't have a, were not a sera from non-infected animals did not. So as conclusion, this peptide is, could be included in a multi-epitopic vaccine, which means that instead of using a whole protein, a whole recombinant protein as a vaccine, one could use a series of B and T cell epitopes in, in, in a combined vaccine that might induce protection. Well, and this is the resulting publication of this work. So finally, we try to see if there are other GPI anchored proteins in Babesia bovis apart from the VMSA. And for to do this, we, we did a bioinformatic approach, an in silico approach, uh, taking advantage of the sequenced genome of one strain of Babesia bovis, which is the Texas strain T2B. Its whole genome was sequenced, and so its proteome can be predicted, it means all all the proteins that are in that genome, and those are about 3,800 proteins. And on those, and that genome, and the proteome, predicted, predicted proteome, we predicted the presence of GPI anchored proteins. And that is possible because GPI anchored proteins have always a very special structure. They have a signal peptide which is something that will, it's a, a stretch of amino acids in the end terminal that will direct this protein to the secretory pathway. And they have a GPI anchor signal in the C terminal that will be cleaved and then the GPI will attach here in the, in the plasmic reticulum. The signal peptide can be predicted with a special bioinformatic program, which is signal P, and the GPI signal can be predicted also with several programs. So we used all of them. So to, to, to have a very stringent uh, detection, uh, not only detected by one program, by, but by two or more programs. And also these are predicted as transmembrane regions. High, uh, they are hydrophobic. And these parts, both the N-terminal and the C-terminal, they are lost in the mature protein. The mature protein is only what is marked here in blue. And we'll afterwards have in this region, the GPI anchor that binds it to the plasma membrane. With this approach, 17 GPI anchored proteins were predicted in Babesia bovis, of which five of which were the members of the VMSA family. And it was very good to find these five proteins, the five that were known to be GPI anchored because that validates our approach. 
the 12 remaining proteins were, had been annotated like hypothetical proteins, which means a protein that the function is not known. So they were uncharacterized proteins. And uh, okay, we started the process of characterizing them. And I will just show a few slides of one of them that we, met, we called GASA1. GASA because it's a GPI anchored surface antigen one. And this GASA1 was expressed by one of our PhD students in Escherichia coli. And then it was purified by affinity chromatography. And here you, she obtained very nice uh, results because the protein is very pure. Here you see a Kumasi blue stained SDS page of the purified protein. And then detection in a Western blot with antibodies, anti-histidine antibodies. Because this expression system that we used, it adds a tag of six histidines in one end of the protein. So it can be afterwards detected by Western blood. And so with this uh, purified protein, antibodies were raised in mice and tested by immunofluorescence. Here you have in the upper uh, panels um, fixed immunofluorescence with a, were the antibodies against GASA1 and also if a propidium iodide as a nuclear stain were used. So in the negative control where no antibodies were added, you can only see the nuclear staining. And then with GASA antibodies against GASA, once it's the green and also the red of the nuclei, and in here, as a positive control, we use antibodies against MSA2C that we know were, were, we knew were going to stain the parasite. And in the lower panels, once it's live immunofluorescence, that means without fixing the parasite, so only the surface is stained. And of course, where no antibodies were added, there was no reaction. And then both with antibodies against MSA2C and also GASA1, uh, where we obtained fluorescence, the parasites fluoresced, which means that as expected, GASA1 is located on the surface of the parasite. And we obtained other interesting results with GASA1 that I will not go through everyone because I don't want to extend this presentation too much, but we found that it's immunodominant that means that sera of most Babesia bovis infected cattle have anti-GASA antibodies. It has neutralization sensitive B cell epitopes. That means that antibodies against GASA1 significantly hamper erythrocyte invasion. We found that it is highly conserved, much more conserved than MSA2C. It is over 98% conserved among Babesia bovis isolates from different countries, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, USA, and Australia, and has T cell epitopes that induce lymphoproliferation. So conclusion is that GASA1 is another attractive vaccine candidate. And here is where the paper was published and Daniela Flores is the PhD student in charge of these experiments. Um, in addition to what we are doing and other people are doing, there are interesting uh, investigations that are being carried out in USA and Japan. And because they are producing transgenic Babesia species to be used in live vaccines, not subunit vaccines like I mentioned, but special new generation live vaccines. And this was possible through the development of transfection techniques and also gene editing by CRISPR-Cas. And uh, you see here photographs from these researchers where you have transgenic uh, Babesias. And uh, these Babesias can be useful, for example, to um, mutate or delete a gene. For example, if one could identify a virulence gene in Babesia bovis, one could obtain an attenuated strain that cannot revert, that cannot revert the phenotypic, uh, the virulent phenotype. Or if one um, identifies a very important uh, gene for the sexual processes, one could obtain a strain 
that cannot be transmitted by ticks. Another possibility is to insert something in the genome. For example, one can insert, and actually it has been done already, to insert a gene of an ant a coding for an antigen of the tick of Rhipicephalus microplus. And then it would be a Babesia, a live Babesia, that expresses a tick antigen. And then one could have a dual vaccine that would protect against Babesia and against the tick. One can also insert a marker sequence to have a DIVA vaccine, which is a vaccine that will differentiate between infected, naturally infected and vaccinated animals, which is very useful for epidemiological studies. Or one could insert um, several copies of a gene coding for an antigen that is a vaccine candidate. Or for example, to insert this gene under the influence of a very strong promoter. And then what could have overexpression of a, a vaccine antigen. So these are things that are happening and will probably develop more in the coming years. But I just wanted to bring to you the kind of high technology research that is also being carried out in uh, Babesia bovis or in, in, in bovine babesiosis. Well, to evaluate any of these vaccines, one needs to do a vaccine vaccination and challenge assay uh, where one evaluates the temperature, the hematocrit, and the parasitemia. That is the only one can have this hypothetical correlates, but the most important is vaccination and challenge, which in our case, we have not been able to do yet. For bovine babesiosis uh, caused by Babesia bovis and Babesia bigemina, there are no animal models available, which means that the studies need to be carried out in bovines. In the case of Babesia divergence that I told you earlier, that uh, it has uh, there is a vaccine based on a recombinant antigen there is an animal model which is the gerbil and that which is like a like a rodent and and that the the the, the, the availability of this gerbil allowed to make a lot of experiments with doses um, different timings different adjuvants and but with bovines is much more complicated so there, is, there are limitations for vaccination and challenge studies, like to have the right infrastructure. So one needs large tick-free facilities. The animals need to be naive. They need to be free of bovine babesiosis. There needs to be enough personnel to handle the animals. And the lack of personnel can limit the number of animals in each group. There are high costs involved. And in the case of these transgenic babesias that needs to be, uh, that are genetically modified, there are strict regulations to use the animals, to dispose of them, and so on. And as a, as a consequence of these limitations, there have been very few published reports on vaccination and challenge experiments using subunit vaccines, and also these transgenic vaccines as well and always with limited variables. For example, only one expression system, only one immunomodulator or adjuvant, only one dose. And then it is very difficult to obtain conclusions. And actually, unfortunately, so far, none of the few experiments that have been done were successful. So sometimes an immune response was induced, but no protection or not enough protection was achieved. So as a conclusion, there needs to be more financial resources and also joint collaborative efforts to increase the number of these kind of experiments in cattle. And at this moment, the only immunoprophylactic tool that is currently available for bovine babesiosis is the live vaccine. So the most of what I spoke is present in this uh, review that you're also welcome to ask for a copy if you're interested or read. And with this, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I hope to that maybe some ideas can come out from these experiments that can also prompt uh, fruitful collaborations. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Monica. Thank you very much for such a wonderful, informative, enlightening, and very scientific talk. Uh, I, I, I appreciate and I thank you very much for this dissemination of such a wonderful knowledge. With this, uh, I, I would like to invite our respected uh, Professor Mazar Ayaz uh, to have few interacting words uh, with uh, Dr. Monica. Please, to you, Dr. Mazar, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Monica. Dr. Monica. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monica, for sparing uh, such a nice talk and a very uh, eye opening talk was there. And it was really a very fantastic work that you shared with us. And it, is, uh, it will be a player for me. Uh, to uh, inform you that there were more than 190 uh, registered participants with us and there were many academicians, researchers, scholars and veterinarians and even there were farmers also from the uh, livestock farming fields. So it was very elaborating and the most of uh, our uh, listeners were very much uh, happy to hear from you that such a nice contribution is going on because it is uh, also mentioning uh, what's mentioning here this uh, babesiosis is also uh, a life-threatening disease at pakistan so uh, here uh, it will be uh, our player that uh, we may collaborate with you regarding the uh, shifting of uh, some uh, scientific skills or techniques that we may also uh, try to produce uh, vaccine at our local level. As uh, you know, after COVID, many scenarios have been changed. And now the people are frequently uh, collaborating with each other, especially scientific people, that they have their uh, expertise. And I would also request you to please extend uh, your uh, expertise and your uh, collaboration with us uh, also. I am uh, also thankful to most of our audience and uh, I would shift over to Mr. Jamal that he may uh, further introduce, please. Hey, Jamal Sahib, you can't, we can't hear you. Jamal, we can't hear you. Sorry, I, 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 we can't hear you. It's still, and you are not unmuted.
Sir, do you hear me, sir? Do you hear me, sir? Am I being listened now? Sorry for the technical problem. Am, am I clear to everybody now? And my voice is clear to, to the, the listeners. My my voice is clear to the listeners. I just want to make sure that I Yeah, yeah it was clear. It was clear. Okay, Monica. Okay, Monica, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry to, to the listener and the participant for this technical problem. You, you understand that the, the, this thing is very unreliable. Sometimes it, it creates uh, some mess. So I'm sorry to, to no everybody. Uh, yes. Jamal, Jamal, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you clearly, yeah. sir. Sir, I'm really yes, sorry for yes. this. Before you start the second presentation, let me uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Monica, because uh, uh, your uh, system can go again, I'm muting everybody. So let me uh, thank Dr. Monica. Uh, I think uh, the message uh, as an administrator that I got is that uh, it's not just uh, uh, parastology. It's a lot of sciences have to come together. And I could see that uh, medicine, pathology, microbiology, epidemiology, bioinformatics, genomics, and to me, always the food technology, which is going to the farmers and uh, uh, listening to them and uh, solving their problems. Right, yes. So there, uh, there's a lot of uh, scope for collaboration. And Dr. Mazar has already indicated that we'll be looking forward. Uh, how can we be involved and how can we uh, collaborate, uh, collaborate uh, to develop vaccine uh, for our country? Because we are uh, the map that you showed. Uh, we were nowhere, I guess. Uh, neither we are developing anything. Uh, I'm not sure how people are using, maybe for the exotic cattle, they have something. But for the local cattle, uh, nothing is out there uh, that can rescue them if uh, Babesia right. is there. So a lot of scope and uh, my uh, really uh, heartfelt uh, congratulations to Dr. Monica. She was very elaborate and uh, I also learned that she must be very prolific in uh, uh, publishing uh, her research also. Because I've seen uh, at least a dozen, a dozen paper that she has mentioned. Uh, on the way uh, basis. So uh, that was also uh, good to see. Because we researchers, you know, we, uh, these the papers are, uh, you know, blood and butter, everything is for us. So that was wonderful. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very thankful, really, to Dr. Monica. And I hope that okay. we'll be we Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. It, it must be it must be a very informative and educating for our youngsters because I could see that even 80 plus people are still uh, listening to all of us. So it was wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Monica. Sir, sir, uh, um, thank I, you, thank you, thank you very. Sir, uh, uh, Miss Monica, sir, sir, one thing more I want to add on the behalf of our Vice Chancellor, sir. Um, uh, Dr. Monica is sharing her thoughts, her knowledge, and the time in Argentina is 3 a.m. This shows her oh love my. for the science. Oh my God. I wanted to add this for you that you should tell that how much enthusiastic she is still at, at this uh, stage of life that she is working at 3 a.m. for us. This shows her passion, enthusiasm, and love for the science. And I am impressed by this. The people uh, generally this have, I, you know, People generally have this sort of, uh, uh, you know, love for football. Uh, they can watch, yeah. you know, football yeah, at yeah. 3 a.m., not science. 
So this yes, is what sir. Sir, we all that on Sunday Argentina wins the well, Copa America. Well, well, well. Let it be. Let it be a nice game. Let it be a nice game. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. well yeah. fought out yeah. game. Yeah. And, uh, let's let's wish wish Argentina and, well. Yeah. And with Thank this, uh, sir, with your permission, with uh, with uh, with your permission, I want to apologize to everybody for the the small interruption which occurred in the between. That was a technical problem and, and that was beyond our uh, reach, but uh, thanks to the God that we reached. Uh, and now, uh, this moment, I, I would like to introduce uh, our local uh, talent and speaker uh, from Lahore, the University of Veterinary Animal Sciences, uh, Professor Dr. Imran. Professor Dr. Imran, uh, Ms. Monica, and uh, dear listeners and participants, dear, dear uh, speaker, uh, he is a talented researcher scientist who managed to explore two patents. In addition to this, owing uh, to his excellent uh, project writing skills, he won several local and international uh, funds for the research, uh, worth millions in CKR. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Professor Imran, I heartily welcome you on this forum, on this stage, on the behalf of our Vice Chancellor. Please step on and share your thought and knowledge with us. Thank you very much. To you, Professor Dr. Imran, please. Hi, everyone. Are you listening to me? Can you listen to me properly? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, can I uh, switch on my video or just yeah, like it's that? On. It's on. It's on. You continue, please. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Greeting from uh, Veterinary University of Veterinary Animal Sciences. And uh, thank you very much for uh, organizing this talk, especially the Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Mom Sajjar Khan, and uh, Professor Mazar, and uh, Dr. Uh, Abdullah, and also the Dr. Tariq. So, uh, I am pleased here to be invited to present uh, my uh, overview and concept of transmission blocking vaccine against arthropods and arthropod born pathogens. Here you can uh, see the title slide where the different arthropods are transmitting the parasites or other uh, organisms. So we, uh, in a new concept that the, in a vaccine, uh, we can uh, block not only the pathogens within the arthropods and also we can reduce the efficiency of the arthropods for its, uh, uh, of its potential to be a, as a vector. Uh, first of all, uh, as you know already the history of the vaccine and uh, it is actually the immunoprophylaxis through active immunization and uh, I, I think there are a lot more students here, they can understand the type of vaccine first, then I will give the concept what is the transmission blocking vaccine because it is a, a new subject in the parasitology but it is not new for the world, but in Pakistan, we have uh, such kind of activities which has started to develop the transmission blocking vaccine. And uh, you know that in the history that uh, when James Pip, a boy was uh, inoculated and uh, uh, through the work of uh, Janel that uh, originated the work of vaccination in which the uh, cowpox uh, uh, that uh, lesions were inoculated uh, in that boy. So that protected him luckily. So that was the work of the Jenner. And what was the protection in a vaccine? The concept is either you have to develop the humoral response, that is the or cell mediated immunity, that are the acquired immunity. Before the acquired immunity, there is antigen presentation, efficient antigen presentation and signaling pathways uh, that uh, activate the uh, cell mediated immunity and humoral immunity or both because the, for the protection, uh, it depends that which kind of immunity is needed. 
and the initial work of Louis Pasteur and that uh, who is the first vaccinologist who isolated the pathogen and uh, in his hands there are a few vaccines that were uh, developed first of all against pasteurellosis, against rabies and also against anthrax. He isolated and inactivated and inoculated the organism. So the era of uh, uh, modern vaccination starts and for the uh, types of vaccine there after that there are new subject uh, that arose that the what kind of vaccines to be developed now we are refining our type of vaccine as you know the live attenuated vaccine and a chimeric live attenuated vaccine there are different types of vaccines and inactivated vaccines, they do not multiply. There might be whole antigens or there might be secretory antigens. Or the part of the antigen we can also produce uh, in, uh, in our laboratory. And of course, uh, third generation of vaccine in which we are using RNA or DNA as a vaccine. Uh, here you can see the model of a live attenuated vaccine Classically, organisms were passaged for many uh, for many passages or in a cell culture to make it uh, and it's uh, weaken its expression or its switch off its expression. And uh, in the new era that the, in the genetic engineering uh, knockout vaccine have been developed, they are unable to uh, cause the pathogenesis, as Monica told that there are some uh, knockout vaccines in the case of Babesia also. And in the toxoplasma, the microlim 1 and 3 are being knocked out to have this vaccine and tachycides are being used for uh, against the toxoplasmosis. This is through the genetic engineering and live attenuated vaccines have been developed and they are under uh, research process. For the recombinant protein or subunit vaccine, we have a choice to uh, uh, incorporate or uh, the gene of interest in a plasmid and the plasmid uh, which are compatible to the system, for example, for the insect cells in a drosophila cell lines, there is a chance of production of uh, the protein, the protein will be recombinant protein and the added advantage of choosing the insect cell that it has a, a eukaryotic system. So uh, this recombinant vaccine again toxoplasmosis and at a research level has been uh, used by our, uh, by our colleagues also. I have a, a PhD studies on this expression of, uh, expression of this recombinant protein by using the uh, insect cell system. Third generation of vaccine, we also used uh, in uh, in our studies that the third generation of vaccine by using the plasmid, which is actually the DNA vaccine. And uh, the, this uh, DNA like PC DNA3 is used and it has the uh, eukaryotic promoter and uh, bacterial origin of replication. So they can uh, either drip, uh, protein, make the protein in a native form in a vaccinated animal. So added advantage is that yeah, you can produce the protein in a native form. So it will behave like an antigen and uh, it will uh, not be affected by any modification through cold chain because the recombinant protein has a, a problem of uh, keeping in a cold storage to to keep its uh, three dimensional structure because the epitopes are uh, to be conserved to make it as a native protein just like the uh, organism that produced uh, we can inoculate the plasmid that can have this uh, gene of interest to make the protein in the host system. And there are also uh, vectored vaccine, which uh, idea is to use a vector to deliver a gene of interest of another organism in which the viruses, bacteria, and uh, some parasites have been used. And uh, mostly the viruses are used to have the gene of interest. These viruses are incapable of uh, causing the pathogenesis, but they have the uh, in, in increased infectivity. So because of the nano size, there is an added advantage that we can use a vectored vaccine to use as a virus, as a carry, uh, carrier. 
And now we come on the transmission blocking vaccine. What is the transmission blocking vaccine? Actually, the first attempt was done in 1958 with the malaria. Actually, the uh, malaria plasmodium has the uh, sexual stage in the mosquito and asexual stage in a, in a host like a human being. So idea is to, uh, to take the antigens of uh, sporozoites and also the okinids to have the antibodies when the mosquito bites, it takes the antibodies. So the multiplication of the sexual stage stops or blocks in the, in the mosquitoes. So, so the, uh, the era of uh, this uh, transmission blocking uh, vaccine starts with the by, by using uh, the vaccine against the malaria. And the transmission blocking vaccine has also been uh, 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 commercialized against the leishmaniasis. In the leishmaniasis and fetos, uh, manos ligand, that is FML, uh, has been uh, registered and it is against the leishmania donobenai. And uh, this uh, actually the protein that facilitates the attachment of Leishmania parasite to the mid gut of sand fly. And this uh, actually, uh, this protein is a pro mastigot and mastigot surface antigen in both uh, stages of the Leishmania. And when the antibodies against it is produced uh, after vaccination that block the adhesion of this Leishmania tonovanai. Uh, that is the pro-cyclic stage, that is the pro-cyclic pro in the mid guard of the sand fly to block the development of this Leishmania within the uh, sand fly. Of course, you already know that ticks uh, as a vector and uh, these are vectors of uh, very uh, emerging and surgeon tick-borne infectious diseases and in Pakistan we have a uh, a uh, lot more huge problem uh, that the ticks that uh, spread the uh, babesiosis and also the thaleriosis and babesiosis, the babesia bovis, babesia bijamina, and in case of thaleriosis, the thaleria annulata, which is present so far, we have worked on it. And also the recursion organism and anaplasma is also uh, the main causative agent among the recursion organism. And of course, ticks can transfer the uh, bacteria and also the Congo virus. And we are trying, uh, striving to develop the vaccine against these uh, protozoan parasites and also the against the plasma marginal that is also causing a huge losses in our, uh, in our dairy industry. So uh, causing diseases in cattle. So the ticks are the major hurdles. Now we are facing this uh, tick uh, issue that is the season that high humidity, high temperature can cause the uh, uh, this uh, in, uh, the spread of the diseases uh, like uh, I have told you. And here you can see the model of Subolsin uh, for the anti-tick uh, that is the transmission blocking vaccine. And uh, uh, Subolsin was initially identified in heart ticks and was subsequently revealed as an ortholog of acrin in insects and vertebrates. So in a work that uh, through RNAi technology, it has been observed that uh, when the Subolsin was blocked, that uh, lowers the tick infestation and its feeding and infertility. infertility. So, uh, and the idea in transmission blocking vaccine is not only to block the sexual stages of the protozoan parasite within the vector and also to reduce the effic efficiency of uh, the uh, vectors like ticks if it has a less infestation and it hinders the feeding ability and also the fertility. So we can overcome uh, these vectors to developing the uh, transmission blocking vaccine against the ticks. Here a tick guard vaccine has been commercialized and uh, in uh, countries like I think in, uh, in uh, Cuba there is also a tick vaccine and also in Brazil of course Argentina has a huge problem of ticks and, and there is a uh, vaccine by using BM86 proteins that's the gut protein it's also the a hidden protein that is blocked through the through the uh, by the 
and the bodies that it takes and uh, thus reducing the number weight and the reproductive capacity of engorging female ticks so uh, these vaccines are also the idea to block the uh, block the uh, attachment of uh, further attachment and also the uh, feeding ability is hindered and the, the, thus the reproductive uh, ability by laying the eggs is hindered uh, we, uh, we have recently a project from world bank and in which we have the idea to develop the uh, transmission blocking vaccine against ticks and tick borne pathogens and uh, Luckily, we have a Choristan University of Veterinary Animal Sciences is our uh, um, strong collaborator and we are working it. Hopefully, uh, we, uh, we develop the vaccine against uh, not only against the ticks and tick-borne pathogens and we have the two uh, huge uh, problems that are the ticks of uh, Rifficephalus species and also the Hyloma and Rifficephalus that uh, transmits the Babesia bovis, Babesia bijamina, and uh, Anaplasma marginal. And uh, for the hyaloma, that are not only spreads the Chlamydia annulata, but also the Congo virus. And now it is the uh, eve of the Eid that there's a danger of spreading of these uh, uh, Congo virus among the human population. So, uh, idea is to first uh, identify the molecules. Uh, in the salivary secretions so as to uh, use these molecules to have a transmission blocking vaccine if we uh, discover these uh, molecules in our ticks and also to understood, understand the biology of the ticks. At the end, I finish with the acknowledgements and that is the project we have uh, uh, grand challenge, under the Grand Challenge Fund. Uh, by tackling food security, by controlling ticks and tick-borne diseases in bovines, we have the capacity uh, in our university uh, to have the molecular parasitology laboratory, which have been developed from the funding of the Grand Challenges Canada in 19, uh, to, uh, 2013. And after that, we started the search and uh, we afterwards we developed the different laboratories in our uh, institute that is the cell culture laboratory and the immunology laboratory and tick rearing facility we have and uh, we have also the entomology laboratory and i am very much uh, 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 obliged with our uh, dedicated research students who are working uh, around the clock in our uh, labs for developing and working uh, to solve the problems in, uh, in against the diseases which are prevalent in the field of parasitology and we are open-handed with the collaboration we have uh, collaboration from all over the world and uh, and the foreign uh, collaborators are uh, and they are keen to work with us and we with their expertise and also we hope to have the collaboration with uh, Dr. Monica in future to, to solve our uh, big issues. Uh, thank you very much for the listening and uh, I am again thankful to the uh, Cholistan University of Veterinary Sciences for, uh, for inviting me for giving the, a brief talk. Thank you very much. Dr. Jamal, where are you? Any question from the participants or I feel pleasure to answer their questions? If there were Any two, let me, if Jamal can't be there, uh, let me 
I think Dr. Muhammad Amjad has uh, his hand up. So let's listen from Dr. Amjad. Uh, sorry, once again, uh, that I, I, I spoke few words after uh, Professor Zimran presentation, but again, the technical problem appeared and now I have to repeat what, we, what I said. Uh, I, at the end of the Professor Imran presentation, I said, I am very much thankful to you, Professor, for your time and energy and for sharing this descriptive talk with us. And uh, you have sent an excellent product in the shape of Dr. Abdullah to our department. He is my colleague. I am personally thankful to you. And now uh, it is the time for the question answer session. So uh, before I take the questions, I request the participants, the listeners, uh, to raise their hand as our worthy vice chancellor said that he sees two hands and now the third one is coming. So I would start from Dr. Muhammad Amjad and now uh, please you are being put through for asking the question. Dr. Muhammad Amjad, please. Was I was I clear? Yeah, yeah, we could hear you. We could hear you. But Ramjad, if you can't speak, can you put it in your in the chat maybe? We can see your question in the chat if you can't um, unmute yourself. Actually, chat is disabled if uh, you uh, it appears that Mr. Khalid, our IT person, can you make it appears that open uh, Muhammad Amjad is, is not there? Uh, I would move toward Mr. Munawar Hussain. Please, we are going to throw for the question. Mr. Khalid, can you Hello. unmute Dr. Amjad and Dr. Yes, uh, yes sir. Amjad, please unmute all those who have their hands up. Yes, uh, sir. I have, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, for such a, a wonderful organization and this wonderful seminar. Go ahead, please. Amjad, what is your question, please? Yeah, uh, sir, I have uh, some questions uh, related to Dr. Monica. Ms. Monica. Yes. Yes, please speak. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for such a wonderful uh, seminar and such an elaborative uh, your talk. And I want to ask uh, about the some questions related to the uh, your work related to minosamine. You have discussed in your some slides. Uh, so I want to ask, uh, have you ever checked some other aspects of minosamine or something like the N-acetyl minosamine or some other thing like this? So I, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't understand uh, what, Mr. what, 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 what uh, is with minosamine? Uh, Mr. Amjad, uh, would you please write down your question or you, you, you may say it again, so I may decipher it for uh, Dr. Monica, please. Would you repeat it, please? Would you make it more simple? Okay. Uh, I want to ask, uh, Ms. Monica have mentioned in some slides that they have discussed and checked the role of minosamine. Yes. Okay. Okay. I want to ask, you have- Yeah, please. Yes, you have checked 
some other aspect of menosamine or some other carbohydrates? Yeah, no, um, no, we have not. We have not. We only know that manosamine, uh, it did not affect the shape of the parasite. So they looked very much alive, but we have not checked the effect on other, on other carbohydrates. Now, importantly, uh, Babesia bovis, Babesia sensu stricto, all the Babesias, the true Babesias, they have, a, also they have, for example, N-glycosylation, but a very simple one, a, which is only a form of two N-acetylglucosamine. So the, they have a very a simple, simple a carbohydrate a, to be N-glycosylated. And according to our, what we have re read in the bibliography, manosamine does not affect the synthesis of that kind of carbohydrate. So it appears to be quite specific for the, for the GPIs. They don't have manos, the Babesia sensu stricto, they don't have manos in their N-glycans. So for though it will not affect the synthesis of those carbohydrates. I, is that your question? Does that answer uh, your question? Uh, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. And I would like to thank you if you please share your some papers uh, related to this. Sure. Yes. No problem. Yeah, you will be, uh, Mr. Amjad, you will be given the email ID of Dr. Monica and her contact information. And definitely she will be sharing all her updated literature and, and other relevant stuff. Yes. Thank okay. you very much for your question. Okay. Thank you very much for your okay. question, Mohammed Amjad. And now I would like to move on with another hand raised, which is uh, which belongs to Dr. Vakas Ashraf. He has his hand raised. Vakas Ashraf, you are being put through. Please ask your question. Thank you very much for giving this uh, giving me this opportunity my question is that uh, dr monica has uh, told us uh, the live vaccines which have been prepared for babesia they can cause disease in adults which are uh, above one year of age so can you elaborate this point and secondly is this the case with the trans uh, transgenic vaccines as well or not dr monica dr monica are you with us? Can you unmute yourself? Mr. Khaled. So is my question clear? Clearly heard? Uh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. They are waiting if Dr. Monica can be unmuted. Yeah, she cannot speak, sir. Mr. Khalid, can you unmute Dr. Monica? Mr. Khaled, IT. Mr. Khaled, this, if he is there. Dr. Jamal, he was sitting with you. Can't you ask him to unmute Dr. Monica? Yeah, but the, the answer she has given, let me read. We don't know why the attenuated strain causes disease in adult cat. Transgenic babesias are only experimental yet. That's a, right, uh, I think, very comprehensive and brief answer. Right, sir. Right. Thank you, sir. still having a problem uh, unmuting Dr. Monica. Uh, but uh, let's see what else is there, Dr. Jamal. 
No, Dr. Jamal is absent. Or maybe, I don't know. Yes, he has also added that no vaccine with transgenic babesias. Sir, we, we, are, we are really sorry. We are encountering a serious technical problem and I heard your voice, but I was unable to reply to you. I was listening to you and I am sorry. I feel your anger, but I'm really sorry. I'm helpless That's on this okay. point. That's okay. That's okay. I heard, I heard Dr. Walkas Ashraf's question, but uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Monica heard his no, question. She, she, and, heard, and, she heard and she has given uh, a reply in the chat, so no problem. Okay, now, okay. I will move yeah. ahead now, uh, sir. Now I will move ahead with Dr. Samia Taslim. She had raised her question. Dr. Samia, thank you very much for the patient and sorry for the problem. You are being put through. Please ask your question. Assalamualaikum. My name is Dr. Samia. I am the PhD in microbiology in working in different institutes. Uh, my question uh, is to the development of uh, animal-based vaccine. Um, can uh, these activities rise the resistance uh, to the uh, infections and viruses um, if used the genetical-based vaccines? Because the mutations and changing uh, continuous process for the infection, disease, and viruses. Uh, so, how can I search the alternative sources to control the viruses? Because the virus's genome is so much difficult and uh, continuous changes occur. So, first, uh, uh, we uh, control Samia, the, these Dr. infections. Samia. Dr. Samia, Dr. Dr. Samia, Samia, you need to make it clear that your question faces please which focus, speaker. Please focus, yeah. please focus yeah. on the topic. Be, be precise, be focused, and you are asking question to who? Dr. Monica or Dr. Imran, please make it Dr. clear. Dr. Imran. Dr. Imran, yeah. please, uh, Dr. Samia asked you a question. I, I request you if you... Uh, reply uh, the respective uh, participants. How to control these diseases in this smart ways? Because the, if we control the disease to uh, step, different steps uh, follow, so it is managed, it is manageable diseases. Okay, Doc, we got your question. Dr. Imran, are you with us, please, sir? Actually, <clears throat> what the concept I have given you, the viruses, actually the spread by the arthropods. And uh, in the field of virology, I am not the expert one to tell you the how much genetic changes or other things are happening in the viruses. So it needs the uh, complete studies on the genomic diversity and its uh, hybridization in nature. So for the arthropods, the idea is if we block the arthropod attachment or its feeding, so we can uh, overcome the other pathogens also, including parasites and bacteria and viruses. They are transmitted by either by mosquitoes or by ticks. So that was the idea concept I have to give you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samia. Uh, this response from uh, Professor Imran, it satisfies us you, I believe. Uh, and now on the screen, I don't see any other additional hand raised. Uh, so it means the, 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 this e-conference is heading toward its final moments. And uh, I, 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 I have a question, uh, Dr. Monica, do you hear me? Dr. Monica. She, she, she should be I, on mute. I, yeah. I do, I yeah, do. She, I hear you, yes. Okay, okay. Dr. Monica, I, as a moderator, uh, this question is in the capacity of your humble student. I learned a lot from you, so I have a question. You talked about uh, uh, the vaccine. So vaccine, uh, basically, we understand that uh, in case of parasitic infection, I have a question. Uh, which immunity 
which aspect of immunity you think will be more rapid, more fast, and more, whether it's T cells or whether the humoral immunity, please. Okay. Do you understand my question? Yeah, right. Yes. Well, which will be more rapid, you said? Which will be faster? Yes, more faster, more rapid, more aggressive in case of babesiosis. Mm -hmm. If you, if we, if we classify, if we ask a question to the undergrad student, if they ask me this question, which immunity plays a pivotal role, a key role, and which is more faster, more aggressive against this uh, babesiosis? Yeah, I, th I think I think the the um, what mimics the innate immune response, which is very fast, that would be the cellular response that would be faster because interferon gamma directly acts on the parasite and also the production of um, oxygen radicals uh, that it destroys the parasite with the macrophages. So that that should be faster. But if a vaccine can do that, that I don't know. But apparently what is the vaccine development, what tries to do is to mimic the innate immune response because it has been seen that the calves are um, resistant. So they try to, uh, for that reason, that is the hypothesis that I wrote, uh, interferon gamma, for example, that is a very fast molecule to act. So I would guess that it's a cellular response, but the cellular response connected to innate mechanisms. And then would come the, the, the antibodies, but the, the, the humoral response would, be, would, would take longer. It looks like one needs both components, both arms of the immune system. That is what I understand. But we, no, mm, sorry. Uh, but but, but I, I understand your answer. If I have to tell my undergrad students here, I would tell them that, this, that the cellular response, T cell response will be coming earlier, faster and aggressive, right? Right, yes. Okay, right. Uh, one, last, one, one last very simple question that uh, you said in your presentation about the transgenic parasite. I want to understand that this trans transgenic parasite, what makes it uh, special that it won't, won't be transmitted to the, to the, to the animal? Uh, whether it will be the plasmid inside it, whether it be uh, what agent, uh, I know that, uh, that the transgenic parasite, what will be doing it special that it won't be uh, transmitting to the, to the animal? Ah, uh, you mean the, the transmission blocking, the, the, the ones yes. for uh, blocking the transmission? The transgenic parasite. Yeah, yes. no, um, because the thing is the following. The parasite needs to, in the tick, to undergo also multiplication. So the parasite, actually the tick is a, 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 the definitive host of the parasite. And there, a lot of processes are going on. So the parasite really multiplies there, invades organs, continuous multiplication. So it is a very effective machine, the tick, to uh, produce the parasite. Now, if you block, suppose that you inoculate the cow with an antigen that is, is expressed in the tick so that antibodies will be, will, will be raised in the cow for that antigen that is expressed in the tick stages. So when the, when the tick uh, sucks the, the blood of the, of the cow, it will receive these antibodies and the antibodies will go to the hemolymph of the tick. And there in the hemolymph of the tick, they will attack the sexual stage of the parasite. So the parasites will die in the tick, which means that that tick will be sterile. It will, when it is, a, it will not transmit the parasite to the next generation of, of tick larvae. So the, the transmission will be blocked for the, in the tick, not, not in the cow. I don't know if it is clear enough, but you, yeah, what you I, understand? But, but, uh, sorry, but I want to understand like how we're going to compare the virulence of a transgenic parasite versus uh, the parental uh, parasite. Ah, no, you will not. Uh, the, 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 par the, the parasite will develop, it, will, it, it needs to be an attenuated strain. So you inoculate the supposed, okay, depends, because it can be a subunit vaccine and then you only work with the transmission, 
or it can be a transgenic parasite. It's two different things, actually. It's two different things. So the, 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 ah, you mean the transmission blocking? Well, because if you suppose that you have a transgenic parasite that is attenuated and doesn't have, has a knockout in a gene that encodes for one um, protein that is basic for the parasite in the sexual stage, in the tick, which means then that attenuated parasite will bring protection against Babesia, against the virulent Babesia, the parasite, the, 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 the attenuated parasite. And on top of that, it will have a knockout. So when it is, that parasite is sucked by the tick, it will not be transmitted. It's, it is like two different approaches actually, but uh, like two different things. One acts in the tick and the other one acts in the cow. I don't know if that is, I answer clearly your, your question. Uh, Dr. Monica, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, it, it really answered uh, my question in some ways. And now, uh, before I invite our uh, Honorable Worthy Vice Chancellor for uh, the last termination okay. stage of this e-conference, I, as a moderator, I want to say bundle of thanks, uh, Dr. Monica and Dr. Imran for being with us. And in addition to this, I want to thank all the participants here locally from Pakistan on all around the world for, for showing their patience and, and, and courage and energy for, for learning this wonderful topic. And hope this is uh, just a start. We will keep on meeting on such uh, scientific uh, events. Uh, this is the time uh, I should be uh, inviting our honorable vice chancellor uh, to take the stage and say the conclusive remarks for this conference. And before I say bye, I wanna apologize all the participants and listeners for this little interruption in between. Thank you very much, uh, uh, sir, uh, 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 our vice chancellor. I, 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 I invite you to please uh, take the stage, take the forum and uh, talk to our uh, participants, please. Oh, thank you. It's uh, really tricky that once you uh, mute yourself, it's difficult to get uh, unmuted. So anyway, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jamal and uh, Dr. Mazar and Dr. Tarek and others uh, who uh, organized all this. Uh, I have already thanked Dr. Monica, but uh, I think I'll be uh, happy to do that again. Uh, so I'm uh, thankful to Dr. Monica for uh, sparing time uh, that early in the morning. And uh, also Dr. Imran Rashid. Uh, I expected Dr. Imran to share uh, the science they have generated, but probably he was told uh, that uh, he has to be simple. Uh, uh, so maybe he was simple because of that. So we wait uh, maybe at some other occasion that uh, Dr. Imran uh, shares uh, uh, the science generated uh, at his lab and the collaborative uh, work uh, that the uh, U.S. is doing uh, through the World Bank or other projects. Uh, so I'm also thankful to all the uh, participants. Uh, it was uh, quite lively. I know that these uh, uh, gadgets uh, are sometimes, you know, uh, pinching because uh, you can't communicate uh, uh, as uh, freely and smoothly as uh, if when you are, uh, you know, face to face. So, but anyway, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Monica and Dr. Imran uh, for sparing time and uh, enlightening uh, our audience, uh, which were quite diverse from different countries and different universities of Pakistan. So I look forward uh, to have uh, further collaboration uh, from uh, both uh, Dr. Imran and Dr. Monica, uh, not just in uh, maybe parastology or immunology or vaccinology, but in the other fields too, because we are a developing university and uh, a lot of uh, hand holding is needed. Uh, so with that, uh, I think I thank uh, Dr. Mazar, Dr. Jamal and Dr. Tarek and others uh, who organized all this. Uh, so thank you very much.
Pakistan Pindaba. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the respected Vice Chancellor, for wonderful final words. Uh, so that's uh, this means the buy from our team and uh, from our University of Pakistan. All of you, thank you very much once again for this wonderful patience and gathering. Hope to see you on some other event. And uh, this all from my side. Uh, it's the time to say bye. Hola.